anybody is able to go to this this is july 1st and 2nd it's a friday and saturday friday's just a setup basically um and then in training and then the second is the big distribution but it's at the south texas family camp in carville and if you're able to go you need to contact elisa now or let me get with me so that i can um give you her contact information she needs to know pretty quickly if you're going to be going to that one um, if you need a place to stay if you need accommodations there are some availability at the campground there and it's $25 a night per person um, but she said that guys stay one place and women stay another so um, she needs to know right away if you're able to do that also I wanted to give you an update on our big July 30th um, distribution that she was talking about. Originally, this was gonna be five locations. We were gonna need a huge group of people going. Um, it has changed now. Um, Montgomery County has changed it. They're only doing one location. They are, um, what it is that they're, they're gonna be serving 700 families that day. Um, and it's with Montgomery County Community Assistance. Um, they're going to be doing, it is going to be a huge outreach um, because we're not only, they're not only going to be doing shoes, sole mission, but they're going to be doing backpacks. They're going to be doing school supplies, haircuts, immunizations. I mean, this is like, they have a huge, it's going to be a huge place. Now, because it's gone from five distribution places to one, Elisa said that the most that she's going to need is 15 to 20 people committed from our church because she had already been, you know, getting with other churches that have committed. I'm going to put a list in the back. We need a commitment. I know this is over a month out, but I need to know who is going to go because we need at least 15 people. And she said no more than 20. Um, this is a great opportunity for some that maybe didn't get to go to Dallas with us. It's just a one day thing. We need to be there at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, which means we'll have to leave here at 5, so it, it is going to be a long day. Um, but we need to be there at 7 to set up. The event's only from 8 o'clock to 12 o'clock. We'll do a breakdown after that, and then you get to come home. So it's a one-day event. There's no overnight. Um, anybody can do this. You know, teenagers, you can do this too. Um, anybody that has been and done a distribution with them, we kind of know what, it's, what it looks like. But she's going to need some people that are going to be fitting the shoes on the children and um which is one of the most remarkable parts of it i think um you get to see their little faces light up and the parents faces light up and um, she's going to need runners which you're going to be running back and forth from the fitting room to the um, sorting room and she'll need sorters there is nothing that they're going to ask us to do that not everybody can do i mean there there's a place for everybody so if you have limitations please don't feel like that you can't go and you can't serve because there's going to be so much going on here we will find a place for you and um so please i'm going to put a list back here um i need you to please sign up let me know if you're unsure still right now pray about it pray about it and i promise you will not regret regret going to this um also Something else she is in desperate need of right now is boys' shoes. She said, I know everybody's going to say, what about girls? Because it's always fun, more fun to shop for girls than it is boys. But she needs boys' shoes of all sizes. Um, she needs some girls' shoes. She's going to email me. Um, Y'all know Elisa. She is, like, going 100 miles an hour at all times. Um, I had to set an appointment to talk to her on the phone Friday uh, and while she was in the car because that's the only time that she had. And so we got to visit for about 30 minutes. But um, she's going to email me a list. So we are going to start a shoe drive soon. We're going to be doing that, collecting shoes for her to help that. Um, also, we need, she needs a work day. She needs about um, four to five people that can come to their facility in Conroe to be able to help break down one room upstairs and move a few things and to also sort. They just, they can't get it all done with just her and Kelly. And so, and with them being all over the place, it, it's really hard. Um, so I have several dates during June and July. If that is something, I've had some women come to me and say that they would like to do something like that one day. Um, most of the dates are during the week. So I know for us that work, it may be a little bit hard. 
Um, if, unless we can take off. The only open Saturday they have is July 23rd. I am going to be out of town that weekend, so I would not be able to go then. But I have a lot of dates. So if you are willing to go down there and help them get their distribution center in order, um, do some light moving things, you know, sorting, there's just, there's plenty to do, but not enough workers. So she desperately needs about four to five people from here for us to choose a day in June or July. And I have those dates. If you're interested, come to me and I, we can work that out. Also, um, we're going to be showing a video here in just a minute. Kelly is about to go, you know, Pastor mentioned, um, the shooting that just happened in Uvalde in the school. Um, I know right after this happened, there were a lot of pastors that were sent there to help counsel. Well, they're now gone. And so Kelly and one other um, pastor are heading there. They need our prayers. They need us to wrap them in prayers because anytime you're doing God's work, the enemy's coming at you and he's coming at you strong when you're doing this kind of work to stop that evil that's happened there. And so, we do have a video that we're going to share here of Kelly just talking to us. We're going to share that. But also, after that video, I want you all to know, and, and Pastor may visit just a minute after it, but we are going to take up a love offering for him um, and for the other pastor to help them while they're there because they're going to be, I mean, they're just like us. You know, prices of everything are going up. Gas prices are going up. I mean, they're taking time out of their normal life to go and minister and and love on these people that desperately need it. And so we are going to do a love offering for him as well today. But we're going to show this video. Marty, if you want to go ahead and show the video. Good morning, Impact Cowboy Church family. Really honored to be a part of your service this morning. And a uh, big thank you to Pastor Stan for allowing me to uh, be a, a part of the service. It's good to good to see all of you as I stare at the camera and not really see you. Uh, I'm coming to you for something really important. And normally I'd be coming to talk about shoes, right? And uh, giving shoes to kids. And that's going to be uh, a big part of our summer as we kick off our summer, but this time it's it's a, a different aspect of our ministry. Uh, many of you know that uh, along with what we do, I'm also a licensed counselor and licensed in the state of Texas and the state of Missouri. And uh, so we do disaster response and you know that I use my counseling during disaster response, but um, about a week and a half ago, you're all very well aware that uh, there was a tragedy in Uvalde, Texas, where uh, a lot of fourth graders and their teachers lost their life in the school shooting. And I have a, an opportunity to go and be in Uvalde for a few days and walk alongside one of the pastors there and some of the families and uh, just just try and be the presence of God in, in their midst. And so I'm uh, just asking that you would pray for me as I go there. I'm not going alone. Uh, back in May 18th of 2018, there was a school shooting in Santa Fe, Texas. And a good friend of mine is a pastor there at Dayspring Church. His name is Brad Drake. And he asked me to come. We, we were there almost from the very beginning when they had uh, put families uh, that were waiting to hear about their kids who had passed away. Uh, we were given access to the building where they were at and were with them when they learned about uh, their loved one passing. And uh, stayed there for over two weeks and then made numerous trips back and continue to go back and help and work with those families. And so Pastor Brad is going to go with me, having walked uh, with his community through this. So we're going to go, going to leave in just a few hours uh, this afternoon and go to Uvalde and be there all day Monday, all day Tuesday and come home on Wednesday. And this will be just the first of many trips that we'll make this summer and probably throughout this year and, and maybe even more. We're going to be working with a pastor named Joe Ruiz. He's the uh, local pastor of a church there. And uh, even Pastor Joe is is fighting through some personal things. They've had a death in their family not related to the shooting. So on top of everything else and walking through walking his family and his uh, community through this tragedy, they've had a personal uh, loss. And so just really need your prayer. We know from walking through this with Santa Fe that uh, the enemy attacks in this big, horrible way, and then he continues to attack the families and the community. 
as they respond to this. And so any uh, really plagues those who were first responders and those who uh, are coming to the aid of those who were first responders and the families. And so just the biggest thing is that through the next few days and weeks that you pray for us, uh, as I said, pray for Pastor Brad, pray for, pray for Pastor Joe and pray for myself. I, it wouldn't upset me if God got tired of hearing the names Kelly, Joe and Brad. Uh, there's a, a story in, in uh, the Gospel of Luke where a widow was uh, really bugging a judge. She wanted uh, some uh, victory over her enemy, and, and she just kept going to the judge, kept bugging the judge. And finally, the judge said, fine, if you'll stop bothering me, I will rule in your favor. And uh, it was just because this lady kept on bugging the judge. So uh, I would appreciate it over these next few days and weeks if you would just keep bugging God for us. Just keep calling out the names Kelly and Brad and Joe uh, before the Lord and asking God to help us as we minister to the families and to the pastors and the first responders in Uvalde. We need your prayer. And uh, it, it really strengthens me and uh, brings a lot of peace and comfort to me knowing that I have uh, Impact Cowboy Church family behind me. You got my back and I know that and I'm so grateful for that. I'm grateful. Uh, for Brenda and for Pastor Stan and Kay and, and all of you who back us up and uh, just just grateful that I can be a part of this service this morning to let you know what's going on. And I will be sending updates and letting Pastor Stan and Brenda know what's going on and uh, let you know if there's anything specific that you can do or specific that you can pray about uh, through this, uh, through our response to this. So again, thank you so much. We love you guys so much. You're such a vital part of what we do and you go with us and you have a part in it. So thank you so much. God bless you. So the thing that you see there with Kelly, he didn't get into a lot of description what was going on, but in Santa Fe, when they had the school shooting there, they were invited to go there. And one of the pastors he's talking about is going, went with him during that period of time. And he didn't tell me this until yesterday when we were talking. He was like, Stan, when we went down there, you know, he said, we ministered for a couple of days. And that um, about the third day that he was there, they got attacked by a spiritual attack. And the pastor that he was with was staying in a different place than where he was at. And they both had the same exact dream at the same exact time. And it scared them so bad that they actually was ready to leave and come back home. And they had to have another pastor come alongside of them and pray with them. And he said, Stan, he said, in that trip, we learned so many things. He said, we were in such an emergency need to go. We were just go, 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 go that we didn't have time to pray there before we went there. We were just responding. And he said, but this time, he said, I am absolutely not leaving until we have prayer partners who are standing with us and praying with us. Uh, the one thing that he didn't really say too much, he is going to be ministering to the first responders that are there, and they're going to be ministering to a lot of the people that was in the medical staff. A lot of those people got messed up really, really bad, the police officers, the firemen, the things that were there that saw the aftermath, and they're going to be ministering to them. They're also going to be ministering to some families. There's one Catholic priest there that I would really love to be able to turn around and lift him up today. He actually, this weekend, had to do 12 of the funerals by himself this weekend. Uh, guys, I don't know about y'all, but when you do a child's funeral, it is hard, much less 12. Uh, so guys, today is not one of those days that we want to really make a lot of light of or make a lot of fun of. Today is a serious day, and our missionary is blessed to be able to not only be at uh, Santa Fe, but also to be called down because he specializes in this. He was asked for specifically. So when we ask for a love offering for him, one of the reasons why we want to pay for that, or at least help him out, is so that they can go and this other pastor one of his own family members passed away in the midst so they're doing a funeral for the family members so they're having to help take care of that church in the absence of that pastor as well as coordinate with the local responders local news agencies that are using that church as a hub so guys here's the thing there's a pot up here on the front if you want to give them to that it is absolutely fine you can make it check out the impact cowboy church every single penny that would be given to them will go straight to them uh, we will send that check out this week and make sure they're there uh, but guys this is completely um 
something that you feel like is not a mandatory thing. Um, who would like to pray for me so I can get started this morning? Thank you, Rayford. So guys, for most of y'all that, uh, that know, today is Pentecost Sunday, which Pentecost Sunday is, happens 50 days after Passover, and is the day that we recognize the infilling of the Holy Spirit to the church. It's actually considered the birthday of the church. It's when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and the followers of Christ and filled them with the Holy Spirit. How many of you ever heard the word wait and really appreciate the word wait? Anybody ever been excited about hearing the word wait? Husbands, please, there's two things that you do not do with your wife. You don't turn around and tell them, calm down, it'll be all right. And don't tell them to wait because you said so, amen? But Jesus did that with his disciples and said, wait. And so we're going to go through this Pentecost Sunday and go through a few things, but I had to go back and really kind of go through a few things before we get into that. So this may wind up taking a couple of weeks to get through. Because I don't want to rush anything. I want to discuss the importance of the cloud and the flame. Guys, there's so many things about our relationships that we have that we need to make sure that we take literally Scripture and apply it to us. How many of you know all Scripture is good? Amen? And it's able to turn around and get you out of some dark places. Pentecost is always associated with the flame as we'll discover in the next couple of weeks about the flames that were dancing upon the disciples, and we start talking about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But the flame has been around long before that. Uh, when we start looking at Pentecost Sunday and we start looking at it, it was originally a first fruits um, celebration. It was a time, it was a festival where all the farmers brought their first fruits to the Lord. Guys, I don't know about y'all, but the first fruits is always the most important unto God. He doesn't want what's the, the leftovers. He don't want the, what's been picked through. He wants first in everything. He wants first in your life. Guys, when we see where Israel was being, or being delivered out of Egypt, it's interesting. There's one person who has a firm foundation, but yet he's even guessing within his relationship uh, with God because he doesn't really know who God is, and he's having to work it out as they go. And guys, let me tell you something. Your relationship that you have with God is personal. Nobody else can get saved off of your relationship. They have to have a relationship with God personally themselves. So as we start looking at Pentecost, we've got to take ownership of Pentecost, and it's got to be for us because the flame was always a representation of the presence of God in your life. Let me ask you a question. If somebody were to look at you, would they see the presence of God over your life today? Would they recognize by the evidence that you have in your life that you are a child of God, that he loves you, that he follows after you, and he follows you not only during the day, but also during the nighttime, that he's there with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Guys, I want to know real quick, every morning that I wake up, is God with me or am I with God? Well, I always know that God is with me. The question is, am I with God? And that's what the question I'm going to ask y'all today. Guys, if you would, open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3, please. We're going to stay in Exodus quite a bit this morning. I don't know if we're actually even get uh, over to the New Testament yet because we need to establish uh, what we've got going on. We've also got communion this morning that we're going to try to uh, be a part of. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert, and he came to Horeb in the mountain of God. 
There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush, although the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Then the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, and God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now, is any time that you see fire in the desert and something is burning but it's not getting consumed, I'm going to be honest with you, that would catch my attention. Okay, and I don't know about y'all, but fire, how many of you got a burn barrel at your house? Anybody? If you got a burn barrel, if you got a pile that you're burning, you see the flames, you see the sparks, you know, going all over the place. But can you imagine what Moses was like out in the desert, looking over and seeing this bush on fire and it not being consumed? All of a sudden he says, well, I've got to go check this out. Now, I don't know about y'all, but... If I'm walking toward this bush, and then all of a sudden it calls out my name, Moses, Moses. <laughs> hey, you fully got my attention now. I'm here to listen. Okay, here I am. Who are you? And all of a sudden God had to come back and say, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You see, while they were in Egypt, a lot of people didn't really know God personally because they had been away from God for so long that they actually identified with the gods of Egypt at that point in time more than anything. But they always knew about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it was more of a rumor. It was somebody that had been taught. How many of you remember your fairy tales and your stories that you used to the high sop tales when you were growing up? You always knew these stories. But let me tell you something. God is more than a story. God is more than a rumor. God is more than what somebody else tells you. God is what you experience him to be. Now, guys, I don't know about y'all, but I know that each and every one of us have a story and a testimony about what God has done in their life. But how many of you can remember the very first time that you ever met God personally, so to speak, the day that you had a comeuppance and you had to come to God and you had to say, Lord, here I am. Lord, I'm so sorry. Use me. I'm willing to do whatever you want. I don't know about y'all, but I remember that day, and I, at that time, I was scared. But I'm going to tell you what, looking back on it today, I can tell you that day was the greatest day that I ever experienced in my life. Why? Because that was the day that I started getting to know who he was. The question is, have you gotten to know who God is past the burning bush? Have you gotten past that point where you're, you're, you're worried, you're scared, you're afraid because fire is always this consuming thing. Fire represents destruction. How many of you ever seen a forest fire or the after effects after a pasture has been burned? Everything is charred and everything's black. But have you ever noticed that sometimes fire brings new life? How many of you ever seen a forest that's been caught on fire? And all of a sudden, it starts coming back within a year or two. I saw Mount St. Helens when I was in Washington and went to the museum up there and went and saw that. And what was interesting, when the volcano blew, there was a point where the fire came through and burned off all the underbrush, and it opened up seeds, and these seeds had been dormant in the ground for years, and all of a sudden, the forest grew back at such a rate, they could not, ex they could not expect how fast it would grow back. Sometimes we go through a fire, and sometimes it changes us, and it makes us better. It causes new growth in our life. And when we see this fire that's in the bush, um, Deuteronomy, y'all can stay there in Exodus, but in Deuteronomy 4, 23 through 24 says, be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord, your God that he made with you. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything. The Lord, your God has forbidden for the, the Lord, your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Guys, I don't know about y'all, but I don't want to get to the point where I experience the fire and jealousy where it's been upset. If you've ever been in a relationship and all of a sudden you find that one of you in the relationship's jealous, how many of you know it makes a living hard time? I'm not going to say what I was going to say, but it makes a hard time for you because you don't know how to deal with the anger, the frustration. You don't know when you're going to get over it. 
Guys, let me tell you something. The last thing that we need to do is we need to walk away from God and follow after idols. Why? Because we have a jealous God. We have a God that loves us so much that he wants to be number one in your life. He doesn't want someone else coming to fill the place that he's supposed to be. So when we were talking about coming to the altars, the altar is a beautiful place to come have this relationship with you and God Almighty. And guys, we may have 20 people around you praying for you, but let me tell you something, that is a personal time between you and God. It's a day that you can sit down and talk with him and you can share the dirtiest secrets that you've got. How many of you got a closet that's got skeletons in it? Am I the only person raising my hand? My gosh. (laughs) Baby, we better buy a cemetery plot and get rid of some of these. Because we look at this situation in our life and we start asking, where are we at? What's going on? What's, what's happening? Only God can give us the answers in our life. And when we start looking to false idols, whether it's media, whether it's TV, whether it's um, books, self-help books, there's only one self-help book and that's the Bible. And you've got to be the person that's responsible for opening up that Bible and getting into it. And when you start reading what the Lord says, applying it to your life. Because when you do, all of a sudden you find out that there's safety and there's protection in the presence of God. How many of you ever felt like you've been superly attacked, that you felt like, man, there's just no way to get out of this? Guys, when you are being attacked, there's two reasons why you get attacked. One is because you're not in the presence of God, or that you're fully, completely submitted into the presence of God. And when you get to that point, when you are with God and you are doing his will, the enemy will come after you and will attack you. And he will mess with your world. But here's the great thing is, who can be against us if God is for us? And if God is for us, we don't have to worry about being attacked. Yes, you will be attacked. Jesus said that you will be persecuted as Christians. When you become a Christian, does not give you a free pass through the hard times. It just gives you somebody to walk through the hard times with you. And guys, I don't know about y'all, but I need to have God with me on a regular basis. Because I don't know about y'all, but haven't we all experienced hard times without the presence of God in our life? that would be sunk. Because I'm going to tell you what, even in the worst of your times, even in the darkest of your times, there's always a presence of God that's right there. All right, next to this, let's go over to chapter 13, verses 20 through 22. When Egypt let the Israelites go, They were blessed, they were given money, they were given gold, they were given silver, they had their herds, they had all these different things. They did not leave Egypt poor. They had quite a bit of stuff, but how many of you know that money won't buy you nothing in the desert? Have you ever tried to buy a pair of sandals in the desert? There's no shoe shops out there. So that's why God had to make their clothes last. That's why they didn't wear out their shoes. Some of y'all are wishing that you got kids now. You had some of those sandals because your kids will go through shoes left and right. But in Exodus 13, verses 20 through 22, it says, After leaving Succoth, they came to Ethium at the edge of the desert. By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. See, the cloud was that fire and it was the proof, and the cloud was the proof of God's presence in their life. Guys, I don't know about y'all, but have y'all ever been to a place where you've never been before? and you're lost, and you're trying to figure out where you're at. I love it whenever I go to a state park to go ride my horse, and I've never been there, and I'm trying to figure it out, and all of a sudden somebody yells at you, hey, you're not on state park property anymore. You're on mine. Get off. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. You're you're trespassing. But you see, God didn't want them to go down the normal road because if they'd have went down the normal road, they would have been attacked. So he took them the long way. And they started going through the desert and started going the way that only he could send them. So I don't know about y'all, but when we get lost, I have a GPS. I like a GPS, but a GPS will lie to you as well. And especially if it's outdated. 
If you're going through an area and that bridge has been built and that new road or that new bypass and it always keeps telling you, go back to such and such, go back, turn around, you turn, and you just want to look at it and say, shut up. But you see, God had this GPS, so to speak. He had the cloud and he had the fire. Guys, I don't know about y'all, but have you ever woke up and asked, where's God in my life today? And you wished you had a little presence. You wished you had a little signal. You wished you had something to tell you that God was there with you. Guys, the Egyptian or the Egyptians did not understand what the Israelites were seeing for the first time. The Israelites didn't understand what they were seeing for the first time because it was something new and something fresh. And when you have this cloud that's following you during the daytime, now I don't know about y'all, but I've been in some deserts and it gets hot. How many of you know you're kind of thankful for when a cloud comes by? You got a little shade, right? You get a little protection. But yet you follow the cloud, and guys, guess what? The cloud didn't follow them. They followed the cloud. We've got this thing in church where we expect God to follow us everywhere we go, that we want him to bless our mess wherever we go. But God never wanted to follow after you. He wants you to follow after him. God wants you to be able to get to this point where you look to him for direction and guidance and nobody else. Guys, I've, I've been watching throughout the years in this country, and we have definitely changed. We're no longer the country that we once was. We no longer follow after God. We follow after the world, and as the world has taken its uh, influence upon us, the church is being changed. The church is no longer what the strength or pillar of strength that it used to be for the community. But in that whole 40 years that they were in the desert, do you know that cloud and the fire never left them for 40 years? He was constantly with them 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 40 years. Guys, I don't know about y'all, but I want you to understand there is a physical presence that you can have God in your life 24-7. You don't have to worry about not waking up. He is constantly there. God is omnipresent. He is absolutely everywhere that you're at. Do you realize he was in church before you got here this morning? For all of y'all that were running late coming to church, God was already here. Somebody was telling a story about little Johnny was saying that they were lost and they couldn't find God and they were asking Johnny uh, for directions and he said, look at me, if you lost him, I don't know how to find him. Guys, God is always with you, but you have to humble yourself and you have to come to the place where he's at. If you're in the desert and you've taken a wrong turn, it's about time that you get straight again and get back to the last place where you knew where God was at in your life. Repent, get right. How many of you ever lived your life without the presence of God? When you were a sinner, when you were just have absolutely no thought of God in your life, and man, there was this emptiness. But when you get God in your life, it gives you purpose. It gives you a sense of direction. It gives you guidance. I love it whenever I'm able to hear the voice of God talk to me during a hard time because only Him, only He can give you direction and give you guidance. Uh, we have several people in this church right now that a family member is in really bad health and struggling. Guys, I want you to know that right now, there's two voices they need to hear. They need to hear the voice of God over their life, and they need to hear the voices of their family come around them and speak blessings to them. Because when they know that they're loved, it makes things a little bit easier, amen? When Kelly goes down there to deal with this thing after dealing with Santa Fe, he's got experience in this issue. But can you imagine what it's like going to talk to these first responders but can you imagine what it's going to be like having to go talk to some of these parents and some of these other teachers and some of these other kids? He will not only be there just for a few days, but he's going to be going back and forth for the whole summer, making appointments and spending time with these families. And they will not be charging them. It's all free. So guys, that is the presence of God going before that community and bringing people to them to minister. If you would, turn a few more chapters over to Exodus 33. Egypt had, or not Egypt, but Israel had been with God out in the desert for a little while. 
They had seen the fire. They had seen the cloud. They had followed him around. They were learning this new God, but yet they were not perfect. And so Moses goes up on the mountain. We all know the story. He goes and spends some time with God. And after a little while, people started panicking, thinking that Moses done died up on that mountaintop, and he ain't coming back, and they better figure out something. So all of a sudden, they go and they decide that they're going to make a golden calf. Now, his brother, the priest, it's funny, if you go read the story, Moses is asking, what happened? He said, well, everybody just took off their ornaments. They took off their earrings. We threw it in the fire, and his calf came out. How many of you know that's sin talking in your life? That sounds like a teenager that just wrecked your car for the first time. I don't know what happened. It just happened. Guys, we know that there's always something that leads up. But in verses 1 through 3 there in Exodus 33, it says, now God is mad during this period of time, so let me preface this that. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people that you brought up out of Egypt, and go to the land that I promised in oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying that I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. Now, how many of you know that is not comforting in your life? Amen? That is not the thing that you want to hear. But the thing that really touches me in that, even when God was mad at his people, God was willing to fulfill the word that he had promised to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He had promised them their promised land, their land of milk and honey. And even though Israel had sinned and walked away from him, God was still faithful enough to fulfill his promise. Guys, listen to me. Let's look past the idea that God said, I'm not going to go with you because I just wipe you all out. How about let's look at the idea that even when we sinned, even when we've fallen short of the glory of God, that God is willing to make provision to give you what he's already promised you. Guys, I don't know about y'all, but that makes me happy because I've messed up. How many of you can raise your hands and say, you've messed up? But yet God will feel that he will fulfill the purpose and the plans that he has for you. But you see, I love what Moses did, does at this point in time. I, I imagine Moses was sitting there, shaking his head, and he was humbled that God was speaking to him. And yet he still had a heart for his people. He still had a desire to see God do something with them. But you see, here's the interesting thing is, we look at the presence of God, which the presence of God brings you safety and protection. It also brings you fellowship with God. But yet, God has already promised to give you something. But you know what? I would rather have the presence of God than I would have the present of God. Why? Because how many of you have seen a child get a present at Christmas time? And for the first two weeks, man, that is the hottest little toy they've ever had. But after about two weeks, they, they get bored of it and move on. But the presence of God, that's what I desire. That's what we should all desire in our life. I would much rather dwell in the presence of God. Because in the presence of God, all of these things that he ever promised you will always happen. But yet, if you look in verses 7 through 11... It says, Moses used to make a tent, and he used to pitch it outside of the camp some distance away, and he'd call it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of the meeting outside the camp, and whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tent, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped each at their entrance to his tent. And the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. See, I want you to catch this. God is drawn by your desire to worship him. 
You see, Moses didn't set up the tabernacle. He didn't set up the tent of the meeting in the camp. He went outside the camp. It was a journey that he did. It was an effort. And he would go set up this tent, and he would go stay there, and he would follow in this tent. But his assistant, Joshua, the son of Nun, how many of you know he is the one that eventually takes over Israel when Moses is no longer able to go? But where did that start for him? It started when he followed Moses to the tent of the meeting and stayed there. You see, what really gets me is you notice that the cloud didn't stay over the people. The cloud followed Moses. And when he went into the tent of the meeting, did you notice that all those people, they just came to the mouth of their tent, but it didn't really say that they followed and went in? Guys, I don't know about y'all, but I want to ask myself this question whenever I see this. Was Moses the only God-fearing person in the nation of Israel at that time? Well, guys, he was the only one that had a personal relationship with him. And so the cloud followed him to the tent. And while he was in there, that tent would stay there. The cloud would stay there. And he would speak to him face to face. Guys, do you realize that God wants to call you friend? Do you understand that? There's a song that we used to sing in churches a while back, and it was said, I am a friend of God. And that was the, the name of the song. Guys, we need to understand that you can have that relationship with God, and when you have it, only his presence will satisfy the things in your life. Guys, let me tell you something. Cars, vehicles, houses, money, none of that stuff will ever satisfy this desire that you have in your life, only the presence of God. I was kidding with a friend of mine this weekend. They go to quite a few vacations and concerts and stuff like that. And we were just talking about the going out. And a lot of times nowadays, I don't know about y'all, but the people that I grew up listening, most of those people have died. All right, so now if I'm going to hear their music, I have to listen to tribute bands. And tribute bands are never quite the same as the real thing. Amen? I saw a thing last night. It was about the, the life and the times of Leonard Skinner. And I started watching it for a couple of minutes because, man, I was one of those guys that used to hold up a lighter when Freebird came on. Amen? I was one of those guys when Sweet Home Alabama came on. Man, I was in the back of the pickup truck. I was partying, having a big time. But now, all of a sudden, now, uh, we're not listening to real Leonard Skinner anymore. Now they got all these tribute artists and all these people out there, and it's not the same. But even when they come on, it brings back memories of what it used to be like. But, you know, I no longer want to be there anymore. And to be honest with you, I love that song, I Am a Friend of God. And to be honest with you, there's some things that sometimes in our past we have to leave behind. It doesn't mean you've got to quit living. That ain't what I'm saying. But is God your number one? If God is your number one, guess what? That cloud, that fire can follow you throughout the days of your life. It can turn around and be right there with you. The presence of God is so needed in our life and guess what? We need to find out who and what we are. Who are you? You are a child of God. What are you? You are a friend of God. I think about what it was like with Moses being in that tent. And I wonder what it was like to spend with time with God. You know, we struggle with prayer time, don't we? How many of you struggle in the mornings when you get up to spend time in prayer? To spend time reading your Bible. It's a struggle. I get it. And man, there's some times that you're waiting, you get distracted, you want to know what the weather's going to be for the day, you want to know what the news is, you wonder what all these things are, and you wind up walking away from the presence of God when we need to be in the presence of God more than anything. The presence of God is what gets you through your day, and it keeps you from feeling alone. And verses 12 through 17, and then I'm going to stop it at this. And Moses in Exodus 33, verses 12 through 17. This is where Moses picked the time to speak with God. How many of you know with your spouses? Don't, don't have an argument with your spouse when you're mad. Don't argue with your spouse or a friend when they're completely upset. How many of you know sometimes you need to pick your battles? Pick the times, right? Here's what Moses did, and starting in verses 12. It said, Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. 
You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that in this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless that you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do this very thing that you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Guys, with the presence of God, it gives you peace. Because to be honest with you, when Moses said, hey, look, if you are going to send us out of here, if you don't go with us, I don't want to go. Why? Because I want the peace of God. I want the presence of God. And I'm not satisfied going with some angel. I want you, Lord. I want the provision, the protection, but also I want the presence of God. And guess what? You can have one or the other, but I would rather have both. I would rather have the presence of God the protection and the provision of God. And I would love to know that he is right there with me because do you notice that it doesn't mean that you won't have bad things happen in your life, but the presence of God will be there with you when it does. Some of y'all are getting ready to have some in, your empty nest syndromes in your houses. You got kids that are going to be moving out, going to college. And some of you are thinking, man, I'm not prepared for this. Well, you've had 18 years to prepare for it. Six weeks ain't going to get the job done. So what I'm going to ask you is if who's the number one in your life? Is it your child or is it God? If your child is your first and most important thing in your life, I'm going to ask you, take a step back. Make God be the number one presence in your life. Because if he's number one, your child will be in a lot better place. Because then the obedience and the presence of God will be about your life and he will give you wisdom. Because guys, somewhere along the way, our kids have to grow up, don't they? How many of you are ready for that? Anybody? Some of you say, well, pastor, I'm ready for my kids to hurry up and grow out and move up. Well, guys, what I'm here to tell you, I'd love to say that my kids could live with me for the next 40 years. But I would be doing them a severe disjustice. Why? Because God needs to work in their lives to answer there, to bring them to a place of their calling. Only you will learn from God when you're in his presence. I love this book. Listen to me. What I'm fixing to say, some of you will say is wrong, but it's not. I love the word of God. And I love to read the word of God. And it sets me on fire at times. Whenever I'm reading, I feel this stirring in my spirit. But the reason that we have that is simply because we have the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life to bring to countenance, to remembrance what God said and did, what Jesus said and did. You have God with you now. You don't have to look for the cloud. You don't have to look for the fire. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has been given to you. And as we come into Pentecost, as we'll read about next week, the disciples were waiting patiently for the presence of God. Remember Jesus said, do not leave, do not go past or go and collect $200. Stay there in the upper room and just wait. Guys, I'm going to tell you right now, the church needs to learn to wait for the presence of God before they strike out on their own. Because there's some things that are good ideas and there's some good things that seem right. But until God says go, don't you dare move and don't you do anything. Because when God says go, then you're prepared fully and you're armed fully and you've been deposited into. God will never send you unless you're ready. How many of you ever done something when you wasn't quite ready to do it and you fell flat on your face? I've experienced it. I know you've experienced it. I have fallen flat on my face so many times. And you know, I kind of don't like that. And in the spiritual realm, when we do that, then we have consequences. Because how many of you know you have to live with the sin that you have in your life and the consequences thereof? Guys, there are some things that we like to do away with. Do away with any future sin, but deal with what you've already done with in your life and make peace with it. Give it to God and let him deal with some things. Guys, I'm going to stop there. I wish I could get farther, but we don't have enough time.
But I want to encourage you today. This is, we are not a Baptist church. I'm not uh, an Assemblies of God church. This is just a non-denominational church that believes that the Word of God is the Word of God. And when we read the Word of God and we realize that that fire and that cloud can follow us, we're going to read next week where the, the cloud and the fire showed up at church. We're going to read where the cloud and the fire came into the church, the dedication of the temple, and it was so thick and so heavy that not even the priest could do their jobs. Do you realize that church could be a place with the moment that you walk in that it could be alive and be just so energetic and so crazy in a good way that you wouldn't want to leave? I remember when I was a kid going to a church that was a Nazarene church, and we had revival. And the revival of the Nazarene church back in the 80s meant you didn't know what time you were going to get out of there. And I remember as Pastor George Blythe would get up and preach, and he would start somewhere about 6, but I remember on multiple times, let's not ever leave until 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. And I remember that the presence of God being so thick as a child, as a 10 to 12-year-old child, just being drawn to the altar and just cry and weep. Now, guys, I don't know about y'all, but there's not many 12-year-olds that wants to go to the altar and cry and weep. But we used to see it all the time. But we also came from a generation that feared God, that desired God. And I want to encourage you today that if you're at a point in your life and you really need to have the presence of God in your life, please, if you don't see the physical evidence of God in your life, you can find it. But you need to go search for him. What did Moses do? He went and set up the tabernacle. He went and set up the tent of the meeting. He went and found him. So many times we're expecting God to come find us. We have to be the ones to get up, to come to Him. So when we do altar calls here at the church, it's not for anybody's benefit other than your own. So we get ready for communion here in a few minutes. I want to make sure that each person that's here today, that you've got a clean, clear conscience. You don't have anything bothering you. You don't have anything that's separating you from the presence of God. You don't have any fights. You don't have any quarrels. You don't have any undealt with sin. Because here's the thing is, we all have sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So there's nobody that can turn around and laugh at you or make fun of you. But the altars are open. If you need to come make right with God, now's the time to do it. Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, as we seek you out, Lord, as we find you, Lord, as Moses went to the altar, and Lord, as he came to you, Lord, I ask in Jesus' name that, Father, that you would come into this place today, that, Lord, as each and every one of us, Father, needs to find you in every way, in every shape, in every form. That, Lord, we're able to see the cloud, see the fire, but, Lord, even if we don't see that, Lord, we need to see the manifestation the presence of God in our life on an everyday basis. Father, every man, woman, and child in this place today, Lord, we desire to see your presence. Lord, we desire to hear your voice. Lord, we've asked where we've sinned, that Lord, that you would please forgive us. Lord, where we've had fights and quarrels with our friends, our neighbors, and our families, Father, we ask that, Father, that you would forgive us for that. But, Father, you would set us back on the path of restoration. That, Lord, those relationships be healed, be touched, be made whole. Lord, I ask that, Father, as we go forth throughout our day, that, Lord, we're able to see you, to hear you, and that, Lord, we're able to respond to you. That, Lord, we no longer ask that you follow us, but, Lord, we follow you. So, Lord, teach us what it's like. As Moses said, teach us your ways so that other people would know that we found favor with you. And Lord, I pray over this nation. Lord, I pray that this nation, Father, wakes up and comes and repents. Lord, your word says that your people who are called by your name, that if they shall pray, that Lord, if we shall repent, that Lord, that you would forgive us and you would heal our land. 
Lord, I pray for this nation right now, that, Lord, as we are divided, that, Lord, we come under one authority, and that's the authority of Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. Lord, we ask for your presence, your joy, and your pleasure in this place. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said, as a friend.